Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Today we are going to be doing a frame by frame close up analysis of whatever we can uh, get from the new trailer. I feel like I've done so many of these lately but frankly we've had three different cutscenes come out very soon of Heart of Thorns. So now that the expansion has been revealed they've given us this trailer that um, is showing us a bunch of the new features which have also been revealed to us. So this is going to be showing us quite explicitly Guildhall stuff, the hang gliding stuff, some of the new per uh, profession stuff. Obviously Ritlock is going to be showcasing a lot of that here. Specializations, all kinds of things. So uh, I'm going to take us through very slowly. We're going to use a slightly different shooting style for this frame by frame that hopefully should be fun for all of us. Uh, and just see absolutely everything we can get from it. So uh, let's track back to the start here. Um, of course we get all the regular rubbish stuff and uh, see what we can find. There's been a lot of stuff um, coming from people within the community already uh, showing really minor things. Uh, that shaman, uh, a prominent member of the community, actually sent me a direct message on Twitter talking about how some of the armor in this, some of the new armor, seems to have new Crichton written on it. Now it only looks like the new Crichton alphabet, but it could have something to do with specializations and all kinds of things. Alright, let's get cracking guys. So we start off with this initial shot of uh, presumably one of the three biomes ArenaNet talked about adding to the game. Now, when they referenced the idea that there would be three biomes, they seem to be talking specifically about within a single map. Like, you'd have three layers of verticality to the various maps around there. Well, here we're seeing some kind of a very distinctive looking place. Looks quite similar, honestly, to what we've seen of Dry Top before. Or the Silver Waste. This is one of the more barren, desolate areas of the world. I suppose there is a very, very slim chance that this is depicting Ricklock while he's still in the mists, but I doubt it. I guess some of the questions maybe we're supposed to be asking here is, why is he traveling alone? Is this just trailer marketing territory and ultimately won't mean anything? Or is this actually hinting at something to do with the story? Some of the time he spent in the mist where perhaps he came out of the mists at first. Um, but so it is showing us some of these more desolate areas. I think the trailer is quite fun in that it will show us progressing through these similar places to what we've already seen in game. You know, we've got all of these lovely birds um, flying around, which already is kind of new. I mean, there are a fair few birds in Guild Wars 2. One thing I will say as well uh, as we go in, the trailer in general is just astoundingly good looking in terms of graphics. I believe this is representing exactly what we will come to find in game. There were no announcements that there are particularly big changes to the engine that have allowed them to push out better graphical fidelity, but you're definitely seeing a lot of it in this trailer. I can say that at least my contact with NCSoft were like mentioned, oh hey, how do you like those improved graphics? Well, I'm seeing a difference here. The game does look wonderful, but I'm just wondering whether this is just some beastly computer and special environment that they're capturing this footage at for us, and it really won't look too different for us as players, but we shall see. Anyway, so yeah, I think the trailer does something pretty cool. Here we get another close-up of Ritlock, because it's going to show him traveling from some of these desolate areas we've already experienced, going to the thicker jungly areas, and of course that's what we the players desire the most. Here we get a nice uh, close-up. They did reveal on the day that Ritlock is a Revenant, the new class being added to the game. Revenant literally means someone who has like died and come back, or in terms of Ritlock here, he's been to the other world, he's been to the mist and he's come back. Um, I don't think necessarily that the idea here is Ritlock is coming to teach the world the ways of the Revenant necessarily, or that Revenants have never existed before. Mechanically in the franchise, we've never really seen a Revenant. Now that's true, but um, I think the idea is he's just one of perhaps a, a fair few people who have tapped into this. Um, the blindfold here that he's wearing is therefore probably a very explicit reference to a Guild Wars 1 class named the Ritualist. For those of you who never followed the first game or the inspiration for many of the classes in Guild Wars 2, some of them have just been copied over. You know, the Mesmer was a class in Guild Wars 1, it's a class in Guild Wars 2, the Necromancer, the Warrior. But then you have stuff like the Guardian, okay, and the Guardian is a totally new class for Guild Wars 2, but it was inspired by the Guild Wars 1 stuff. The Thief, um, in particular, was not a class in the first game. Instead, we had the Assassin. Two classes were introduced when Canther was revealed in the first game. We had the Assassin and we had the Ritualist. The Assassin became the Thief and the Ritualist has become the Revenant, as we can see here with Ritlock. Ritualist um, thematically had a lot of um, abilities that tied them to the mists. There were many suggestions in the story, in fact, that Ritualists were not tapping into the same kind of magic that um, the rest of the world was, that they were using something more ancient, something more mysterious, perhaps. Something, therefore, maybe outside of the realms of this cycle of magic, the dragons eat and then leak back into the world. And this was an interesting setup that they uh, talked about in Guild Wars 1 and never really looked 
into for Guild Wars 2. Well, there's so much story about magic now. I'm very much excited that this expansion seems to be bringing back this kind of ritualist idea. Ritualists would summon power through the mist. They could summon spirits from the other realm, different to necromancers with their minions. They would directly call from heroes um, in the afterlife to uh, bring them their strength. And this was supposed to be a different thing to the way everyone else is using magic. And maybe that means Ritlock now becoming a Revenant, seeming very much like a Ritualist. They described the Revenant as similar things to ritualistic things we saw in the first game. Could mean he's, he's, he's like tapping into magics that the Elder Dragons have no control over. And maybe he holds the key to, uh, to our victory now. Because of course that's a big question with the Pact having been destroyed. Anyway, a bit of a tandem there. He's in his uh, Revenant armor, some new stuff. He looks pretty badass. He's got the blindfold. There's not too much more to say. Um, so we're still scrolling around here. The vines traveling through the waste here. Sorry, I've just paused it as we're um, in the transition here. But these vines coming through, um, it, I have talked a little bit already. I did on the stream yesterday. I'll say it to you guys here. I believe they could be doing a setup here. One of the big mysteries of this region of the world is why it dried up and died between the events of Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2. In Guild Wars 1, we could explore the Maguma jungle. This region that we are going to be pushing into for this expansion of Guild Wars 2, we already got to explore in the first game. Except while we were there during that time, it was like and full of light and yes there were some dead barren areas but mostly it had a lot of you know it was called the Maguma jungle for a reason however in Guild Wars 2 it's the Maguma wastes and they set up this plot at the start of Guild Wars 2 why did it become the wastes they've still been hinting at this mystery even in some of the most recent living world patches my speculation for this is that it was a jungle because at the previous Elder Dragon Rising Morgamoth had made it a jungle however uh, Primordus, um, another of the Elder Dragons, another dragon, both Morgamoth and Primordus have been said to be underground, perhaps at different levels underground, but both have been said to be underground. My speculation is that because Primordus woke up much earlier than uh, Morgamoth did, about 250 years earlier, Primordus that was then sapping away and taking all this strength away from the jungle. We know that the Elder Dragons vie for power, they don't, they're not necessarily in, a, in allegiance with one another. And that's why I think that the jungle dried up. And now that Morgamoth is awakened again, we're seeing these vines, to go to what I was trying to explain there, we're seeing these vines, we're seeing Morgamoth reclaim what Primordus had taken from him. And I indeed also think that could be a big part of the story. If we get some really substantive plot going forward here, we could be looking at a situation here where we have two Elder Dragons being dealt with, not just one. You know, they didn't call it Guild Wars 2 Morgamoth or anything, they called it Heart of Thorns. And... Primordus could be a big part of that. We're going to talk about that more as the trailer goes along. So, uh, so yeah, Ritlock's moving along. Get more of these astonishing shots. Here you can see some asset reuse. You know, you've got these people uh, captured and tied up and being destroyed by the vines. Um, is this an existing area we've seen in the game? I have no idea. Is this prosperity? I doubt it. I love the idea of this tree in the background here. This seems to just set off this big scale. Uh, the thing that excites me very much straight away is, oh look, this is a wagon, this is some kind of a settlement. It seems like, you know, it's, it's enticing to think of new settlements that we'll be able to go to. Not just giant maps filled with wilderness, but places people have been living, just like prosperity was. So, uh, and yeah, well, Ritlock's just sort of walking, walking through a bit like a badass. And now we get this beautiful shot. We're in the jungle. And look at just how dense this place is with foliage. Is this going to destroy our PCs? Who knows? But here he is looking very small down here in the bottom. Uh, my first thought when I saw this was immediately to an old shrine or ruin that existed in the Maguma jungle in the first game. Uh, in the first game, obviously, we only got to play as humans. And um, the humans worshipped the six true gods or the five true gods for a lot of it. Um, and the humans had set up many temples and shrines to their gods throughout the world. Uh, there weren't too many locations or building structures within the Maguma jungle we could visit in Guild Wars 1. However, in one of the most remote areas of a place called Magus Falls, there was a mysterious structure, a mysterious building, that uh, was a shrine to the god of fire, Balthazar. And so this was sort of hidden, nestled away in the jungle, never really meant anything. It was just one of those cool, bizarre things that the devs seem to have put there. And so now we seem in Guild Wars 2 Heart of Thorns to be traveling back into the jungle. And I was immediately reminded of that when I saw this. This, to me, the architecture here, it could be that it is not the exact same place. But uh, I have a hunch that that's maybe what they're setting up here. Ritlock is going to visit this shrine and maybe we will at some point too. 
The camera's going to be panning down here a bit. And if we pause very briefly, now this uh, this may be wild speculation for me, but over here on the left, if you watch, as the camera moves down, and we'll replay this a few times, it looks like there appears to be some kind of a statue there. Or maybe this is my eyes playing tricks on me, but perhaps what we're seeing here is the old Balthazar Shrine. It's all been overgrown and destroyed by Morgimoth. And deeper into this construct, into this building, we see the vines have... Um, are like climbed over one of these doors which Ritlock's gonna bust through using Sahothin, setting the entire wall ablaze. Now this for the purposes of a trailer you might not think means too much but it actually demonstrates something very cool they're really demonstrating something is being set on fire here and in a very convincing way animation wise at least it's being withered away and pulled back and the uh, jungle is recoiling and what I think we're seeing here already guys is one of the ways we'll be able to interact with the jungle through the mastery system. They've talked about how masteries will enable us to travel through the jungle in all these different ways. Gave us hang gliding as quite a clear example. Gave us an example of being able to translate ancient languages and then perhaps you'll be able to speak magic words and get through with magically bound doors and so forth. But this seems like, strikes me as another really simple, cool mastery they could do. You know, there's thick foliage everywhere and you're going to need to go through these masteries, progress your character, become a complete badass so that you can can start burning down all these walls and uh, making progress. As I've ex as I said on the stream, I think that we're going to get serious like Metroidvania vibes going on here, um, and it's going to be very exciting to me to wander around in the jungle in the first place and see like all these vines and be like, all right, eventually I'll be able to burn my way through there and get through. Um, it's curious to me though, then with mechanics like this, how does that work in a fully persistent world? Are we going to see phasing become a thing in Guild Wars 2? Would they have mentioned that? Who knows, but it strikes me that this is so detailed and lush looking as Ritlock burns this thing down that this probably is going to be a part of the mastery system, one of the ways that we're going to have to, you know, learn to tackle the jungle. And then, on top of that, we have a golden door, too. This symbol in the background is familiar to me. It reminds me very much of some of, like, the icons that would appear when you would complete missions, for example, in the first game. I think even a little in this game, too, some of the old icons that they used to have. But whether it means something specifically as a shield, I actually couldn't tell you. Uh, what we want to pay attention to, though, for this is, obviously, it's another big, golden, bright door. We were uh, introduced at the end of Season 2 to the idea that the Forgotten, the snake-like people... Uh, uh, built these hidden golden areas and some of them are in the jungle well, this looks like it's going to be another one. Again, um, piece this information together with some more information we got at the uh, the Pack South like uh, announcement, where Colin said to us explicitly, "Glint at the end of Guild Wars One, this big dragon character that died before Guild Wars Two, she flew to the jungle to hide something. She hid something for us, and we're going to be trying to seek it out." Now, Glint was a great friend to the Forgotten, and I believe it's no coincidence that here we're seeing another Forgotten kind of area. Well, whatever Glint hid, she hid it in one of these Forgotten-type places, and I think we could be seeing exactly the area that Glint hid something. Ritlock is now traveling to right now. As he pushes these doors open, we can fly through. Things turn very gold and bright. We're in the same instance, bear in mind. We get all of these lovely um, uh, plants and things. One thing I'd like to point out as well is, as a player, how would we be traversing this kind of area? It doesn't look too easy, right? But think about the whole hang gliding thing. This looks like maybe we'd be walking up this pathway here, and then we'd friggin' jump off, guys, and we're gonna hang glide through. And the uh, track that this camera is about to move down on this trailer right now in a second could be something we experience as players in-game. And that's gonna be that's gonna be pretty kick-ass. There we go. We're going to fly through. Uh, there's not too much extra detail than I can discern as we're moving along, so I'll just let it play along here. We get a huge, huge open area here. Uh, the computer capturing this footage at least didn't take any uh, FPS drops. We get some kind of a wellspring. Again, are we looking at some kind of ley line type thing? I don't know. This uh, architecture, of course, is taking um, a little bit more um, definition and style over the sort of just gold slapped on everything we saw in Season 2. This, if it is indeed still... Um, Forgotten architecture is really becoming quite distinct and divine. Look at these little the squares everywhere. Uh, this isn't something we're particularly familiar with in the franchise before. What could all these waters mean? Is this uh, uh, similar to the wellspring we basically found beneath ore, right? That Traherne used to try and cleanse ore? Uh, who knows? So um, this is very exciting to me, though, what it could mean in story. Even though we only get basically Ritlock walking around, this could mean some cool things. Um, so we'll move along. And again, just thinking about the different areas we could explore. We're going to cut straight away. This is a really interesting shot. We're now no longer with Ritlock. 
Um, we're instead with a uh, band of adventurers, and the thing that you'll notice straight away, number one, these are no established characters. The idea is these characters, we can see right here on the screen, these are player characters. Number two, it's set up in a very specific way, so it seems very cinematic, like some kind of conversation is going to happen with these three characters on the far side of the room. Um, so it would strike me that whatever this setup is here, it seems like some kind of an instance, right? Doesn't seem like the kind of thing that would happen in, those, uh, in, in the open world, but... We have more than five people here. We've got one guy, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten players. They said nothing to us about the dungeon scene. They said nothing to us about the raiding scene. But um, is this what they've taken away from the raiding CDI? They hired a raid developer recently. They hired um, some genius for AI stuff who has now confirmed that he is working on Heart, Heart of Thorns stuff. Are we going to see some kind of a raid here where we are going to go and interact with what looked like Massart? That's really two different discussions entirely there for us to go down. But this is very curious to me. You can maybe look at some of these characters too and try and figure out if we can see any extra specializations going on. Uh, however, I personally cannot see anything. I've heard tales of a thief with a rifle in this trailer, but personally I haven't seen it. Um, so let's talk about this, the story side of things, because we can't really say too much if this is a raid. What does it even mean, right? Uh, three Massart. We'll play it forward a little bit more because we're going to zoom into these Massart here. Uh, I love the, the look of the room is incredible. Some of the architecture in the background here. These gargoyles are like a big thing in the franchise. There's been a lot of them. But so we get these three floating constructs. Now, I've speculated on the channel already quite a lot. I guess we'll, we'll leave it here. Oh, okay, hold on. We'll play it forward so it's not in the middle of the fade. Um, I've, I've speculated already a fair bit about uh, these guys. They did appear in concept art for the original video we got last week or at the end of Season 2. Um, I do still believe these are the Massart. The most distinctive thing about them is their golden kind of look. Their floating humanoid shape. They have um, developed quite a lot visually from how they looked in Guild Wars 1. Um, but some of the core things are very, very similar. You know, golden armor, this helmet, this shape of this helmet is, is incredibly similar. I doubt we'll ever see a Massart face. That's kind of a scary thought. Intensely massive. Magical, magical beings here. We don't see any, like, jade constructs around them. The Massart were uh, a race of enemies we fought in the first game who would use, um, basically, like, golems. They were almost like Asura golems, but uh, a different style. Jade construct that would do all the heavy lifting. You know, if you were fighting against these guys, all the spellcasters were Massart. You know, the Massart would be mesmers and elementalists and monks and so forth. But... Um, whenever you were fighting like the warriors and the rangers and the heavy kind of guys, those tended to be their jade constructs. Now we don't see any of them here, so it is still a chance that these are not Massart, but I absolutely think they are indeed. Um, how could Massart be here? Well, this could be taking place in the mists. If it's some kind of a raid, they could easily do the cop-out thing and say, oh, it happens in the mist, which isn't something I'd like to see. Or perhaps Lazarus the Dyer has set to work. Now, one thing that um, I would love to remind people is Lazarus the Dyer wasn't necessarily the only Massart left alive in Guild Wars 1. Uh, so this race was annihilated. They were our original enemies and we destroyed them as the players. They uh, Right towards the end of Guild Wars 1 in Eye of the North, they revealed that there was one last guy left alive. He swore, you know, vengeance against us and countless future generations and ran away. They started hinting at it, right? All those years ago, finally now in 2015, the, the Massart are coming back into the story from these long ass set up hints. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're looking at Lazarus the Dyer right now. Now I think that would be really, really kick ass and awesome but you guys should remember as well when the war in Kryta ran after the events of Eye of the North they again set up the fact that there were more Massar around there were still the odd stragglers and it wasn't actually the Lazarus was the only only one left there were still some very powerful Massar we dispatched of a few but perhaps some survived also and so that could be why we see three here um, this trailer also is going to show us a little bit more, it would seem, of the Massart later. And uh, it's going to pop up on the screen the idea of having new allies. And just this kind of very um, relaxed approach that our player characters have, as you can see here, moving into the room, does suggest that even though they were once our enemies, perhaps the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And a big theme of the Massart storyline, I've seen some comments from people saying stuff like, um, Oh, there's no way they'd ever be allies. Any Guild Wars 1 player would be outraged to think of them as allies. No! No, that's not true. Yeah, they were original enemies, but this was always a story shrouded in uh, Shades of Grey. It's one of the best arena net have ever done at Shades of Grey. The Massart only necessarily oppressed us because they saw us as a threat because Glint had prophesied we would eventually destroy them and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy, but can we blame them necessarily for trying to save their own skins? Now, yes, they did certain very terrible things, but you would be uh, a fool to suggest there were no Shades of Grey in this story, and I like the idea that when the Massart come back, they are there once again. Now think about it, they're great crime as well. Guild Wars 2 established the story. 
story that thousands of years ago during the El the previous Elder Dragon Rising, all the races could have banded together and perhaps defeated them, but the Massart chose to flee. Now, was that such a great crime of them that they chose not to fight, that they found a way to escape and they decided to take it? You know, like, uh, it, it's not totally black and white. And think about it in this perspective as well. We all love the Tengu as players right now, okay? But they seem to be setting up the same story. The Tengu 2, just like the Masat once before, the Tengu believe in taking flight. Would we hate the Tengu for them taking flight? Perhaps some would, perhaps some wouldn't. But this is what I'm trying to get at here, is I love that we're not just fighting Masat. It looks like something more is going on. Especially if you put that in the perspective of, like, some kind of a raid encounter. Really, really cool. So, um, we're going to move on through now. <coughs> We got the two torches. Uh, here we get uh, some kind of an adventuring party. We've got um, one cool thing to pay attention to are probably the uh, weapons these guys are using. We've got some kind of a, uh, an engineer, I would assume, here with a rifle. This gun looks really kick ass, too. This is what I'm talking about. Graphically, the game looks incredible. The mocap that's being used on these tunes is insane. Just three people here. Does this mean that this is some kind of a five man instance we're looking at? And we've only got a few of them on screen. Um, I don't think you can really tell too much about specializations from this shot. Here we get one of the new dragon enemies in the game creeping up on them. I at first thought this was a pterogriff. Uh, it's certainly not. It seems to be something totally new. The detail on his face there. Let's see if we can track back again. Detail on his face here is brilliant. Look at the lighting, guys. Look at it. It's incredible. Uh, we're going to see this variety of dragon quite a lot uh, throughout this trailer. What could it be called? Who is it associated with? It doesn't look particularly Morgamothy, does it? Um, and I think we're actually seeing a few enemies in this that have nothing to do with Morgamoth, uh, quite frankly. So let's move on forward. And he roars, and of course, it's all intense and epic and so forth. Uh, we get some, uh, again, this I would say is definitely some kind of a Morgamoth enemy rolling towards us, as you can see here. Uh, characters fleeing once again. Different characters. Three again. Uh, I don't, I'm not a buyer of the idea that, you know, because they're showing three characters multiple times, this actually means that there's going to be like three-man content somehow. But uh, certainly, I love the look of the mocap. One thing I'm most excited about for... Guild Wars 2, Heart of Thorns, is the return to personal story style stuff. And hopefully it's all really high quality. Can you imagine if we get this kind of cutscene, this caliber? Uh, now, nothing really suggests we will, because when Guild Wars 2 was originally coming out, we had similar stuff to this. And then the personal story just had those horrible, horrible little cutscenes where you have one character on the left, one character on the right. But still, it's an exciting thought. And uh, the big reveal, of course, of gliders. So they jump off. Hit a, hit a pocket of air and they fly away um, much of the frustration of this enemy here who again like what just watch it don't, don't focus on the gliders just watch, watch the way this enemy moves as it moves along and it lands and you can see the way it, oh, it, it's fantastically done it's really, really, really cool. And I hope we see these kinds of very realistic movements. But anyway, so they fly away. That's hang gliders. That is one of the masteries, as we've heard about. There's not too much for me to say. I like the design of the wings, but that's about it. Here we see uh, a bunch more enemies. Again, I think uh, these look like um, the scarabs. There were so many scarabs in Guild Wars 1. We haven't really seen that in GW2. Maybe this is a return to them. Morgamoth, uh, when we were originally speculating about Morgamoth before we even knew he existed, I would say stuff like, oh, perhaps the oak hearts were minions of his. Perhaps the thorn stalkers were minions of him his perhaps the aloe seeds were and um these are all like old pop-up enemies we don't really see in gw2 i'd love to see some of the new enemies coming in with this expansion be referencing some of those old ones too and the compound eyes look really cool here oh it's, it's fantastic um so again here we get finally um a look at a new class as it would seem or specialization for the game this um i do not believe is a revenant i believe that this is a mesmer and so what you want to focus on with this Mesmer is the fact the Mesmer is wielding a shield. Mesmers cannot wield shields in the game right now. They can summon a phantasm that's sort of like a shield-bearing entity, but they can't wield them themselves. So this, the idea here is what we're seeing is a Mesmer specialization um, that uh, allows him to use or her more time-based magic because uh, really all we've got in the game at the moment is time warp. Now, many of you will be familiar with the idea of Guild Wars Utopia, which was the cancelled campaign from the first game. What they used to do, guys, was there were six classes at launch for Guild Wars 1, then they added two with factions, the Ritualist and the Assassin, then they added two with Nightfall, the Dervish and the Paragon, and then the idea is they'd add another two with Guild Wars Utopia, which was cancelled. Now, those two were going to be the Summoner class, or some kind of a summoner class and something they were calling a chronomancer a time mage 
And many people now think, and I think so too, based on this shield of kind of clocky, coggy kind of stuff going on with it, the shield itself actually looks like a lot of old Utopia concept art. One of this, like a very specific piece of old Utopia concept art. Maybe I can show you guys. Um, I believe that that's what we're looking at. I think this is a Mesmer specialization. It allows it to uh, equip a shield, and it gets more profession mechanics around the idea of time. And so we'll see it cast a spell here. You can see this clearly looks like a clock. Um, it looks like some kind of giant AoE snare that also somehow does damage. They all die. And, uh, and down they go. So there you go. I do think that that's probably Chronomancer. I wouldn't be surprised if that is the Mesmer specialization. Here we get another new enemy. Mordrum Troll. Jumping ahead. Looking angry. We're back to Ritlock. Ritlock's wielding a spear here. They have confirmed, I believe, that um, there is like no new type of weapon coming. So like... There's no great axe, there's no, uh, or as you might think here, like a halberd kind of thing, even though we saw some, uh, a lot of use of that kind of stuff in the concept art cutscenes we've seen recently. That isn't a thing, but Ritlock is wielding this, which would suggest the Revenant, as a class, can use spears above land, or Ritlock's specialization as a Revenant can use spears above land. But um, we get to see some of his attack animations here. Looks heavy, looks slow, looks badass, knocks it on his head. Here we get an Engineer. We'll move back a little bit. Again, another specialization you'll notice that's all the trailer is dealing with right now. Um, and so here you can see he seems to have flying droid drone things around him. Really cool idea. So I, I guess that these are a bit like throw mine where you drop tons of them around you or that trait that drops a ton when you get low health. Except these ones can fly around and move with you. Oh, pretty cool. Reminds me a lot of Ratchet and Clank where one of the weapons you could get was like this thing that would throw all these little droids around and they'd blow up in little nukes and stuff if you did good enough. Man, what an exciting idea. And of course we see him wielding a hammer. Hammer is not a weapon engineer can currently use um, and so that's very curious to me of course we get to see him now move forward and smash up these Mordrum Thornwolves which aren't new enemies but it's cool to see them having the poop beating out of them anyway uh, as for the name of what this specialization could be I asked on the twitch stream for people to win gems uh, what it could be I like the idea of like machinist maybe even mechanic I think makes a lot of sense but um but yeah so there you go that's the hammer. Next, we've got three people. Again, three people uh, running along. Uh, this looks like an Asura guard wielding a greatsword. Uh, one of the casters wielding a staff and presumably some kind of heavy or maybe medium here. Maybe that's what they're doing, the three armor classes here. Um, and we're in a very big, vast area now. All warped, twisted. Is this the mist? Well, unlikely. Here you can see what appears to be the wreck of the glory of Tyria. This is uh, probably going to be a big part of of one of the new zones we'll be going to. Colin spent a while when he was introducing the idea of hang gliders to us uh, on the top, on the idea of climbing very, very high. Like, verticality is supposed to be a huge thing in this game. Uh, those of you who have, like, maybe ever bugged out or messed around in the uh, ruined city of Ara instance, you will know just how high they can make these maps. Hell, uh, even some of the stuff we've seen in game recently, the most recent patch added a diving goggle achievement in the silver waste and if you get that diving goggle you are falling for a long time I think they're taking advantage of that I think what we're seeing this looks like a different dimension almost right but I think it's just incredibly high up in the sky very very high up in the sky and so if we rewatch this as the camera moves around imagine this at the you know the very very height of a huge map and the entire goal is to get to the glory of Tyria or this crashed airship look at this place look down there it's ridiculous and of course to top it off what do we have super high up Dragons. Dragons flying around. Dragons that look a lot like the uh, one we saw those three people battling before. Um, and that's a very curious idea. What happens if these guys are flying around while we're hang gliding? Are we going to have like airborne combat and stuff? Is that way too much to suggest? I mean, we're going to need to be hang gliding. It looks like these guys are running to the edge of this le ledge to jump off and then therefore hang glide straight away. Are these things here to knock people out of the sky? Is this a jumping puzzle we're seeing or just something more normal for the Guild Wars to experience when we're playing Heart of Thorn stuff? Anyway, so yeah, um, we get the uh, airship, a bit of a hint at the story there, and very little else. This looks like a giant boss encounter kind of platform. We see some of the enemies' aerial attacks. Don't really see this too much unless it's some kind of a canned animation, such as Tequattle flying around. Uh, is he actually vulnerable right now? That would be very interesting, but it looks like the characters are just sort of stood there, uh, waiting for him to do something. Very Skyrim-esque, I guess. Now, this next shot is kind of a funny one. It sent me into a bit of a spin for a while. This one specifically here. It looks for a second like this char 
is boarding the, the, the dragon somehow, or even like he's somehow mounting and riding his drake. It's just a trick of the camera, guys. It doesn't mean anything. Have a look again, but we do see some kind of a skill effect from the guardian in there as well. But I believe that could just be a mark. I don't think it's anything major that we have to worry about. But these frames here, there's all, certainly an awful lot we can look at. You can see like a, a character dodge rolling. Perhaps we'll see some new uh, animations here. We've got Twilight. We've got someone with a fractal back piece over here. I don't believe we're seeing any of the new legendaries in this trailer. Um, or even that much new armor necessarily. But yeah, some kind of big boss fight. Looks fun. Here we get a bunch more Mordrum Trolls. We're back to Ritlock. We're back to him in the golden area. Um, he's just going to kick their behinds, a lot like we saw in the other trailer. Looks like he's stealth of some way. These are relevant skills we're seeing here, um, where he's just darting around. Now, in GW1, there were some very interesting skills and like bonus mission pack style stuff, where you would see people flick around very, very quickly like this. I wonder whether we're, how this will feel to play, or whether we'll really bounce away, around in this way as a revenant. But it does look like a fun skill to use, absolutely. And he's still got Sir Hoth in as well, of course. Um, okay, and we come into the last part. This is now when they sort of go through the features, okay? So we've got Journey into the Heart of the Jungle. This shot here reminds me an awful, awful, awful lot of an area in Guild Wars 1 in the Tarnished Coast that would actually be placed currently in Guild Wars 2 between the Grove and Ratasum. It would be like in the middle of those two. Uh, that's curious to me. Um, obviously, the terrain that we'll be going to, how expansive this really is like in terms of size, I have no idea, but that's a cool thought. And again, we get a whole bunch of characters here. But whether that means anything or not, uh, we really don't know. It kind of sucks as well that on the trailer we can't see exactly what class these people are. Because then we could say, oh, and this is this class and they have this weapon. Is that normal or is that not normal? Is this a specialization or is it not? It'd be kind of funny if they did a very tongue-in-cheek thing here where every single character we see is specialized and wielding a non-native weapon. Um, one other thing I'd like to point out um, on this shot in particular, not just that it bears a resemblance to somewhere else, but also these kind of like um, glowing like sh magical shards, one here on the left, one here on the right. These remind me a lot of the Crate Obelisk shards that, again, they were hinting story stuff to do with back during Season 1 of The Living World. And I wonder now whether these are going to have something to do with the story or whether this is just, you know, a, a passing resemblance that doesn't really mean anything. Anyway, so they're looking down there. Looks like a fantastic, cool place that we'd want to explore. Here we get what I can only assume is uh, an image of Stronghold. Now, when this first played, I thought this could have been world versus world. It looks very world versus worldy. But the fact that um, on this version of the trailer, they're actually saying new competitive game mode while it's up. This, yeah, this looks like this is Stronghold. Big, big map. Um, I would have assumed that Stronghold, the new PvP game type, would have just been 5v5. But perhaps the scale here suggests otherwise. Uh, this giant cliff here, will we actually be climbing uh, above this, or is that not really a part of the experience? Um, it looks fairly asymmetrical too, um, unless the, where the camera currently is, is like a complete carbon copy of that there. They're, so, they're fighting over some kind of a central courtyard type area. Is this where we're going to be recruiting heroes or getting supply? I have no idea how any of those mechanics work, and uh, this will be a big thing that I'm really looking forward to. Um, and again, we get another shot, different angle, definitely looks like PvP. We can see the supply depots here. Um, is it just the idea of we're going to be grabbing these and if someone kills you while you're holding them then you lose supply? Do they gain that supply from you? Uh, it's very unclear. Again, uh, you can look at weapons and start this person here has got a chaos bow, another fractal back piece. I guess it's probably the same people. You've got someone popping a uh, chaos aura here. Someone's being feared. No new skill, skill effects as far as I can see though or profession stuff. Here we get the New World vs. World Borderlands. I moved forward a tiny bit too quickly there. New World vs. World Borderlands. Uh, we'll try and pause as quickly as we can so we can get a bunch of the combats. Uh, lots of people running around. Seem to be zerging. Again, you can't really pick out anything super new. But um, this looks massive. They specifically said this was going to be massive. Uh, and it pans all the way up to this huge place up here too. Think about this, people fighting on the floor here, there's some kind of a cave it looks like you can enter, th enter through. Looks like there's almost like platforms we can walk up here. Will we be able to hang glide and things? Will masteries be working here in World vs. World? Is that why we can climb so high? The idea of such immense verticality in a World vs. World map is so tantalizing. Even beyond the other stuff that they said about how they was going to mechanically change. And it goes up quite high. This shot then that we've now cut to, I believe, is still the World vs. World New Borderlands. We looked up and now we're looking down, right? So with that giant cube type area, we're looking up at it. Here we are. Perhaps this is what it's like up at the top. We've got all these lights here. Are these going to be mechanics? How much stuff have they taken from Edge of the Mists? I don't know. But again, look at all these fighting uh, that people are doing down here. Oh, it's, uh, it's very exciting. We've got a bunch of Treb, tons of Siege being placed to fire into this central location. 
Looks like they're embracing the jumping puzzle aspects of things too. Like a lot when it comes to just the general experience of playing the game. I feel like at the start they were like, hey, jumping puzzles are really fun, but we're scared people can't just make regular jumps. And slowly as the games change and you see stuff like the uh, Bazaar of the Four Winds and you see the way they set up Dry Top, they're not shying away from it anymore. It's like, hey, you need some kind of rudimentary platforming ability to do some stuff in this game. Here we get this in a phenomenal looking place. This is a guild hall. They said on a release that guild halls would, um, you would like claim them, you'd find them in the Maguma jungle or whatever. I am assuming they're going to be instanced, obviously. It's not like we're going to carve out portions of the world from one another and have to bid for stuff. Can't imagine that being in Guild Wars 2. Um, but this, uh, presumably then, is a guild hall. And look at it. You get to see um, things being constructed or... This is still World versus World, the new board land, and what we're instead seeing here is what happens when you capture some kind of a shrine or a keep or something. But look at all these buildings coming along here. Ah, oh, it's 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 very exciting. Here we get new civilizations, they explain. Check it out. We get what could be the Hecate. So uh, in Guild Wars 2, we fight lots of Hylek. Um, and the Hylek are like toad people, I believe, is the idea. But in Guild Wars 1, they were also the Hecate. And these guys were frog people. Now, I don't know how frog-like these guys really look, but it does say new civilizations. Again, look at how dense and jam-packed this screen is here. Really cool looking, um, and it's nice to see, again, like the idea of establishments from different civilizations and stuff out there in the jungle. This guy looks kind of angry. Uh, and we can move, again, there's a very short little shot there. Sorry, I missed it. I keep missing these. Um, of us up in the trees. Again, just it's showing the verticality stuff, right? It's showing it. And again, uh, down here, you can now see... We have uh, what look like much more frog-like creatures. And I think these are the Hecate. I think this is why when it says new civilizations, we're seeing the Hecate come back into the game. They almost look mouse-like, but I do believe that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing frogs. And I like that this game is really sort of distinguishing between the two as well, like size-wise and hopefully animations-wise and stuff too, because it could be a bit confusing in the first game. Anyway, so, uh, so yeah, that looks kind of cool. New ways to explore, hand gliders again. It's such a cool feature, it's funny to me that I have so little to say when it comes up on the trailer. Three people again, back to Ritlock. Uh, a giant uh, creature busts out of the ground. This reminds me of some of the enemies I've been fighting in Grimrock. Uh, Basilisk is what I believe this thing is. Again, where I described the Temple of Balthazar early on in this video. Um, in Guild Wars 1, there were enemies. Uh, oh no, not Basilisk, sorry, they were Behemoths. And they were like these things that would be in little pods rooted and they'd like explode out and look at you and they'd like fire range projectiles at you. Never looked anywhere near as impressive as this. But I think that, yeah, that's an enemy we used to see in the Maguma jungle we haven't seen yet in Guild Wars 2. And I think they could, they looked at that. I think the devs saw that and they said, right, let's bring this enemy back. Let's make it look kick ass. And that's what they look like now. Maybe it's even a, like a very rare kind of spawn and perhaps even on, on the level of like a boss. But that's what I think we're seeing. Finally, we have Ritlock. It seems to invoke some kind of powerful ability. I think this could be his elite skill. He could be summoning uh, or calling from one of the great heroes of the past. And here we may be seeing the, the hero. Is he calling from Glint's strength? It would kind of make sense story-wise, right? It would just be cool. I think a lot of people want that. If they've announced to us that we can summon as a revenant the power of Malix, the unyielding, a Marganite from the domain of anguish that's supposedly buried there, could still exist, um, then yeah, we can probably call, call power from Glint too. And uh, he looks like he's got a pretty badass elite skill too, because by doing this, in a second, we're going to see that dragon swoop in. Uh, we come back though for pre profession specializations. Here we have a ranger using a star. It's, uh, it's a repeat of an animation that Elementalists get on their air attunement skill too, but it's going to shoot out thorns, so I guess that's kind of interesting. You'll notice he still has a pet. Now, they said specifically that profession specialization could unlock new profession mechanics, and some people are going to think that means like, okay, so you no longer have adrenaline if you specialize as a warrior. You no longer have shatters if you specialize to a chronomancer as a mesmer. Maybe if you specialize to a chronomancer as a mesmer, you get fast casting back which was the mesmer mechanic from the first game okay so like that's a really exciting idea i will be doing speculation on that in a different video um but here we can quite clearly see a specialized ranger this is a druid he still has his pet which is his unique mechanic but maybe maybe his f skills have changed somehow we, we just don't know um and here we go we'll see him snare and the, the wolf's going to come in. Get a new boss battle. Here, um, I believe we we may still be seeing a Mordremoth minion. He does look kind of barky, kind of thorny. But this could be something totally different. Either way, he looks badass. Pay attention to the fires in the background because we're going to see a few fiery enemies now. Here we go. Look, this seems like some kind of pet for him. This now screams Primordus to me. 
I mean, we haven't really seen Mordremoth have anything to do with fire before, right? I mean, these could be the flames from the crashing ships, but look, this thing is breathing fire! It has magma in its mouth! And again, this is why I think perhaps the two dragons could have a play a role to play in this expansion. Or maybe it's just, you know, a new a new kind of dungeon. Here we get another new enemy. This doesn't look like anything we've seen before, unless it's a Kappa. Am I right with that? Are they called Kappa? Why can I only think Twitch now? Oh my goodness. Um, from GW1, turtle type enemies, but they were native to Cantha, not necessarily anywhere around here. It would be cool though. Uh, I mean, there's nothing that's saying they can't do anything totally new. Here, again, we're seeing a Massart. I thought this was a crate, maybe like a toxic crate, but the helmet is too distinct. We're seeing a Massart, the golden lighting, the golden background. Definitely, we've got Massart we're dealing with here again. And as this appears, it says new allies. Again, uh, tying into what I discussed before, how they may not just be straight up enemies to us. And the, you know, the biggest bomb that they could drop on us is, you know, they didn't they didn't say anything about a new race. And the big bomb would be, oh, the new allies and the Massart, they're playable, have fun. Like, that'd be insane. Uh, challenging group content. Um, we get to see this dragon flying along here towards this chasm. Again, just a cool looking area. I can't speculate too much further on this, except that it could be some part of an instance. Or maybe a new world boss. And reimagined uh, progression, the mastery system. So, as, because this is the mastery system, as Ritlock's using this, maybe this isn't even a revenant thing at all. Maybe the summoning of the dragon is, like, one of the ultimate masteries or something? I don't know. There's still a lot for us to learn about masteries in terms of how they affect combat that they're not talking to us about. So, it's either one or the other. Anyway, yeah, the ghostly uh, dragon appears. And we get the trailer conclude. So, there you go, guys. Um... That's pretty much what I can get out of it. Now, there will be small things. If there's anything massive, let me know in the comments. Uh, I'll be sure to be talking about it still so that we're all in the loop, those of us who are still watching. There's the frame by frame of Heart of Thorns. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, I certainly did. I think we'll be getting a lot more trailers going forward. Probably trailers for all the different specializations and things out there. It's going to be very exciting. Anyway, thanks, guys. Hope you're having a great time. Hope the x pack has got your uh, mouth salivating. And I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, I have... Pretty much daily Guild Wars 2 videos planned out for at least the next week and a bit more. At least. So uh, I'll see you there.